thing a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. And Marrow calls back. It's like, what the hell are you guys trying to do? Kill me? <laughs> this thing's loose. They, they, and they moved it up just a little bit. And he goes, you to make it like Okay. Because <laughs> he, he's always used to a fight, anything he wants. Is like, oh, it's a fight. It's like, no, we, we designed it because we knew you'd probably be unhappy. It didn't matter what we gave you, you're going to be unhappy with it. So all the sensors and stuff, when you guys are doing that kind of testing, it tells you what kind of downforce you're getting. Is that what you're measuring? It doesn't measure downforce. Jim's just reacting to oversteer or understeer, whether the car feels planted and neutral. Right. Um, we have sensors that are telling you everything that's going on in the car, but you can't directly measure downforce. Okay. So you kind of have to extrapolate, you know, basically read between the lines, see, see what you think it is, what the car is doing. But when you make an adjustment here, you know you're not affecting anything else. So you're pretty sure that's what you're changing. Right. Right. Now, one of the questions we had on the exhaust was like the previous C6, they were actually tuned. Uh, the C06 was tuned a little differently than say the, 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 the standard car. Oh yeah, and this will be too. Are they going to be tuned as well? Oh yeah, everything, all the tuning elements, the mechanical tuning elements, uh, inside the mufflers will be custom for this car. And then of course, this car comes standard with the four electronic valves. It's not, it's like NPP on the, on the base car, which is a check the box option. Of course, the CO6 comes standard. So you have four valves in the exhaust. So we have those as well as all the tuning elements, as well as noise cancellation uh, in the car. All of those are variables we can play with to come up with the sound we want. Uh, what's the, uh, the material of the uh Yes, stainless all the way through. Okay. 304 stainless, I think it is. Right. And uh, another interesting uh, uh, thing that we talked about at Palm Springs was the, uh, the carbon fiber torque tube. Yes. And that's a uh, technology transfer for the race car. Well, yeah, I mean, carbon fiber applications you see on the race car are all over the place. Uh, when we brought out the Stingray, uh, we talked about the need to get better fuel economy through cylinder deactivation. The only way to have that be relatively pleasing in the car was to triple the stiffness of the drive line. The way we did it on the standard Stingray Coupe Convertible was to go to steel. Um, carbon fiber wasn't available to us and it's very expensive as you know, but we set about a project to see if we could develop it for the Z06. So we really didn't want to put a steel torque tube in the Z06 because we've always used up like our most exotic carbon applications on Z06, Z01. And so, uh, actually, you can see it on the rolling chassis behind you. You can get a little glimpse, even though the thing is like six feet long, and uh, you know it's a wound carbon tube, six inches in diameter. And it's the first application we think of in in uh, the auto industry for uh, a part like this that actually reacts the powertrain loads. People use carbon prop shafts. Prop shafts are relatively easy because they're just torque. They don't take any other bending loads. That thing takes a huge amount of torque, plus all the torque reaction. I mean, when you launch this car, it's trying to pop a wheelie. And it's trying to do it by picking up the engine and the engine mounts, and all that load goes right through that driveline support of the torque tube. So it's trying to, not only twisting, but it's bending in it's such high loads, it's actually trying to pick the front end of the car up. So it's a, it's a very challenging uh, design exercise. The carbon's not thin, it's very thick. And uh, like I said, six feet long with aluminum bell housings to attach to the trans and the engine. So that's uh, another unique uh, composites application on Corvette. Uh, talking about the, uh, the transmission a little bit, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, some of the rumors previously was, you know, you're going to source an eight speed from somebody else, but it couldn't handle the torque. Right. Uh, now we've got this one that's being built by General Motors. Uh, so I, I would say nearly specifically for this kind of car and for maybe a couple million of these cars in. Uh, um, let's, let's talk about that a little bit in terms of how it compares to the seven speed in terms of like shifting and um, what you're expecting maybe, I don't know, if maybe more of a question for Harlan, like a take rate, but um, I think people would be pretty excited about that. Man. Well, we've heard from customers for years on the Z06 and ZR1. I'd buy one, but my spouse and I can't agree on manual or automatic, and one of us wants the automatic, and so we can't buy the car, and so they're going to buy a Grand Sport. Um, I've heard that story time and time and time again. So it's always been an aspiration to get a very quick shifting paddle uh, that transmission that could also operate as an automatic for people who don't want to operate the clutch. Uh, there was no transmission in the world, like you were saying, that uh, can take the torque of this engine, plus fits in our space. That's the other extremely big challenge on this car, is because of the space between the passenger compartment 
and the, the axle, the differential is so tight, you need a very compact transmission to fit in that space. No, no DCT, no automatic transmission would, would do both of those jobs. So we basically had to turn in-house. And uh, our internal transmission designers from GM are some of the best in the world. In fact, we sell transmissions to some pretty high-level competition uh, you know, as their factory equipment. So uh, you're right, the Z06 is kind of the design case the most extreme design case for that transmission. It's got a, the highest lateral loads, we want this thing to be uh, live on the track. Uh, fastest shift speeds, we uh, benchmarked the fastest DCTs in the world, said you guys got to match those for shift speeds. Um, got to take the torque of this engine, which we said 635 foot-pounds of torque at least. And uh, so that's actually 30 more than the ZR1 had in the C6, so that's a heck of a lot of torque. So, uh, and then the, uh, thermal environment uh, of track duty cycles, plus 100,000 mile warranty that you get from GM. All of these things have to go into a single box, and uh, oh, by the way, it's got to be as light as it can be, it can't be very expensive, and the list goes on and on. So uh, we basically had to turn to who we think are the best transmission designers in the world, our own uh, GM Hydromatic, and uh, they came up with a transmission that meets all those requirements and is actually lighter. It's uh, six pounds lighter than the six-speed it's replacing, um, and more efficient. It's uh, the, the power flow through the trans is very uh, efficient, so the spin losses in the transmission are very low, so in addition to having eight gear choices, super fast paddle shifts, it's very efficient. And uh, compared to, like, I, I think you benchmarked it against the Porsche DCT, and um, the press release said on a wide open, you know, throttle, uh, you're getting faster shifts through the automatic than you would get through the Porsche. Well, there's literally hundreds of shift cases. So depending on your throttle, the engine speed, whether you're shifting up or shifting down, there's a lot of different shift events, uh, we call them, that you can benchmark. So we looked at all of them. I mean, we fully benchmarked Porsche and other DCTs for how long it took. And it's not just how fast the transmission shifts internally, but how fast the rest of the car tells the transmission, because that's part of it. You signal the shift with the paddles, you want the shift completed as quickly as possible in the transmission. So we benchmarked that extensively and uh, asked the transmission guys to not just do a single watt, you know, one, two, three, four, but actually uh, all the different shift events, we want it to be able to be very fast and very smooth. And uh, switching gears a little bit with the, the electronic uh, limits differential, how this all stands for this car? Yes, like the, uh, actually, like we were talking about the the NPP exhaust with the four valves, that standard. Uh, the ELSD, electronic differential standard. Magnetic selective ride standard. Uh, it's really good having all that content standard because that lets you really customize the car. Uh, that means the ride mode selector has all the tools at its disposal to set up the car to be you know, truly weather, eco, tour, sport, or track. It can really optimize everything. That, that's what makes the car that has what the, we call you know, the most authority, the most difference, distinction between the modes. And does the car come standard with a magnetic selective ride control, or is that normal? Nope, that's standard as well. Yep. A lot of standard, and so it's We got a lot of standard stuff. Harlan's taking care of our customers right. by trying to make as much, you know, this, it's a fairly expensive car, and we know everybody's going to check the box anyway, uh, so we really want it. It actually makes a life easier to have all that stuff on the car from the beginning, and then you can do your development work knowing that all that content is there. Awesome. It, it's a good look car. I mean, the, just the wide body is. Yeah, um, it's got quite a stance. A lot of people thought when they saw the Stingray, it's like, man, this thing looks so yeah. aggressive. Yeah. Now, after you stood around this for a while, then you go look at the Stinger. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you, you, we were talking about how you've got, you know, the nice convertible cruisers to the big nasty. Is the big nasty, yeah. How did that nickname? Is that just something he said? That's yeah, just Marcus. <laughs> getting over enthused. Nasty is not a word. I'm sure the marketing and the communications guys were fond of Jim using. Because it's not a nasty car. Yeah, it's very powerful, but it's not I guess it's nasty a viper. Like it's, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it's not crude. It's very sophisticated, and it's, it's going to ride really well. It's going to be just a fine long-term cruising car, too, for people who want that. So it's, uh, one question I have is, um, you know, you, you guys were over doing some testing in Germany and stuff, and we know the car was on the range, but we never did see a video. The standard car, the, right, the, the standard. yeah. The um, 
is that something that Lucas might see, or that was just more of along the lines? Because I know the weather was kind of. Yeah, I mean, we only went the one time. We did our final uh, tuning there, our validation there. We, you know, we did our Autobahn, like steering calibrations and things while we're over there. But we really don't make it our corporate mission to go over there right. on fast laps. So uh, we, we had hoped to get a fast lap or two in, but the weather didn't cooperate. We got rained out. There's no point in doing a fast lap, even when part of the track is wet, which it's such a big track. Sometimes that's true. It's dry in one area and it's wet. But if it's wet on half the track, you're not going to get a good time. And, and we've actually segmented, you know, we based on our development work, we can look you know, we had this part of the track okay and this part. Other people have done that. They segment, they post, here's our lap time. We don't do that. I mean, there's a, it can always be questioned. So we've always said, you know, if we don't run a full continuous lap with a video to prove it, we're not going to put a time out there. But we're pretty confident that if, if we did do that, the time would be pretty impressive. Did this car will be available for export for the most part? Oh, yes. Yeah, it's global homologation. Uh, just like the other Stingrays. We'll sell it in, uh, I think, virtually every market we sell the Stingray in. Um, the, uh, the, the tail light design, in terms of uh, uh, being pushed out further and stuff, uh, one of the articles I saw on that might be a, a bending question, but, um, <laughs> you know, they, they won't, they, they, they were, you were looking at the normal ones, but for some whatever reason, you put the smoke ones on, just that Pete, maybe Peter's liked it and said, I'm for yeah, I mean, uh, we were looking for ways to distinguish this car. You know, it's a little more serious performance car. Uh, in fact, all the badging you can see is dark uh, on it, so you got the bright chrome uh, on the, the coupe and the convertible. Uh, this one wants to be a little more sinister, and so uh, we blacked out the badging, and we thought, you know, kind of the final touch was let's black out the taillights too. You know, they still bright, you can see there, they light up red, uh, but it kind of goes with the rest of the car in that kind of sinister dark character of the car. As far as the tires go, with the, the Pilot Sport Cups, um, are they basically the same compounds? Or are they tweaked for this car versus maybe a, a ZR1 or a Z06 from a um, Michelin bought a ZR1 two years ago uh, as the closest proxy to this vehicle right here. And they spent two years testing uh, tires. So taking the previous generation ZR1 tires, taking them to up to the next level. So these are all be custom tires. Both the standard tire and the Pilot Sport Cup will be completely new, just, just like on the Stingray. And that's one of the reasons we were so fast out of the box, breaking that ZR1 track record, is because the pre-work that Michelin done. So that was the first submission. It's a really good start. Um, so between that and the aerodynamics and the rest of the capability of the car, um, that's why we think we're going to be not just uh, fast on the track, but relatively straightforward to drive, a very uh, easy to approach edge of the performance envelope, higher limits, but uh, people are going to feel very comfortable driving this car. That's right. Um, this car, you said that uh, measured the uh, the most, um, I guess, the most downforce in the wind tunnel. Right. Is that, um, what about the coefficient of drag? How does that relate to this car versus maybe the previous it's, one? It's, there's three levels of aero, and each level goes up in drag and up in downforce. That's always the way it works. Uh, I think, and it's not done yet, but I think the way this car is going to end up, it will be vastly superior to previous generation's top model, the ZR1, in terms of downforce, and similar in drag. Usually a, a race car, they almost don't care about drag. The more downforce, it's almost like any drag penalty is worth it to get downforce. Um, that's kind of been our mindset. We really wanted to plant this car into the ground, but then we also pay attention to drag. So once we get the downforce, you know, as much as we get, then we go back and see, can we get some of the drag back? So we get as much of it back as possible, but it'll be mid, you know, three, five, three, seven, kind of drag coefficient by the time it's done. So I'll shut it off this time, so <laughs> otherwise right. I'll just keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I don't have any questions at the time. I'm sure more will come up, and I'll track you down later. So I appreciate your time. and uh, Thank you. I'll be uh, here. Great job. Congratulations. Thanks. Wait till you drive it. <laughs> <laughs>